This is a read aloud of Raymond's Run by Tony Cade Bambara. I don't have much work to do around the house like some girls. My mother does that. And I don't have to earn my pocket money by hustling. George runs errands for the big boys and sells Christmas cards. And anything else that's got to get done, my father does. All I have to do in life is mind my brother Raymond, which is enough. Sometimes I slip and say my little brother Raymond. But as any fool can see, he's much bigger and he's older too. But a lot of people call him my little brother because he needs looking after because he's not quite right. And a lot of smart mouths got lots to say about that too, especially when George was minding him. But now, if anybody has anything to say to Raymond, anything to say about his big head, they have to come by me. And I don't play the dozens or believe in standing around with somebody in my face doing a lot of talking. I'd much rather just knock you down and take my chances, even if I am a little girl with skinny arms and a squeaky voice, which is how I got the name Squeaky. And if things get too rough, I run. And as anybody can tell you, I'm the fastest thing on two feet. There's no track meet that I don't win the first place medal. I used to win the 20-yard dash when I was a little kid, little kid in kindergarten. Nowadays, it's a 50-yard dash. And tomorrow, I'm subject to run the quarter meter relay all by myself and come in first, second, and third. The big kids call me Mercury because I'm the swiftest thing in the neighborhood. Everybody knows that, except two people who know better, my father and me. He can beat me to Amsterdam Avenue with me having a two fire hydrant head start and him running with his hands in his pockets and whistling. But that's private information. Because can you imagine some 35-year-old man stuffing himself into pal shorts to race little kids? So far as you imagine, I'm sorry, so far as everybody's concerned, I'm the fastest and that goes for Gretchen too, who has put out the tale that she is going to win the first place medal this year. <laughs> Ridiculous. In the second place, She's got short legs. In the third place, she's got freckles. In the first place, no one can beat me, and that's all there is to it. I'm standing on the corner admiring the weather and about to take a stroll down Broadway so I can practice my breathing exercises, and I've got Raymond walking on in the inside close to the buildings because he's subject to fits of fantasy and starting thinking he's a circus performer and that the curb is a tightrope strung high in the air. And sometimes, after a rain, he likes to step down off his tightrope, right into the gutter, and slosh around getting his shoes and cuffs wet. Then, I get hit when I get home. Or sometimes, if you don't watch him, he'll dash across traffic to the island in the middle of Broadway and give the pigeons a fit. Then I have to go behind him, apologizing to all the old people sitting around trying to get some sun and getting all upset with the pigeons fluttering around them, scattering the newspapers and upsetting the wax paper lunches in their laps. So I keep Raymond on the inside of me, and he plays like he's driving a stagecoach, which is okay by me, so long as he doesn't run me over or interrupt my breathing exercises, which I have to do on account of I'm serious about running, and I don't care who knows it. Now, some people like to act like things come easy to them, won't let on that they practice. Not me. I'll hide prance down 34th Street like a rodeo pony to keep my knees strong, even if it does get my mother uptight, so that she walks ahead like she's not with me, don't know me is all by herself on a shopping trip, and I'm somebody else's crazy child. Now, you take Cynthia Proctor, for instance. She's just the opposite. If there's a test tomorrow, she'll say something like, oh, I guess I'll play handball this afternoon and watch television tonight, just to let you know she ain't thinking about the test. Or like last week, when she won the spelling bee for the millionth time. A good thing you got received, Squeaky, because I would have got it wrong. I completely forgot about the spelling bee and she'll clutch the lace on her blouse like it was a narrow escape. Oh, brother. But of course, when I pass her house on my early morning trots around the block, she is practicing the scales on the piano over and over and over and over. Then in music class, she always let herself get bumped around so she falls accidentally, on purpose, onto the piano stool, and is so surprised to find herself sitting there that she decides to just, for fun, try, to out, try out the old keys. And what do you know? Chopin's waltzes just spring out of her fingertips, and she's the most surprised thing in the world, a regular prodigy. I could kill people like that. I stay up all night studying the words for the spelling bee, and you can see me any time of day practicing running. I never walk if I can trot, and shame on Raymond if he can't keep up. But of course he does, because if he hangs back, someone's liable to walk up to him and get smart, or take his allowance from him, or ask him where he got that big great pumpkin head. People are so stupid sometimes. So, 
I'm strolling down Broadway, breathing out and breathing in on count of seven, which is my lucky number. And here comes Gretchen and her sidekicks, Mary Louise, who used to be a friend of mine when she first moved to Harlem from Baltimore and got beat up by everybody till I took her up on, my, on account of her mother and my mother used to sing in the same choir when they were young, young girls. But people ain't grateful. So now she hangs out with the new girl, Gretchen, and talks about me like a dog. And Rosie who is as fat as I am skinny and has a big mouth where Raymond is concerned and is too stupid to know that there is not a big deal of difference between herself and Raymond and that she can't afford to throw stones. So they are steady coming up Broadway and I see right away that it's going to be one of those Dodge City scenes because the street ain't that big and they're close, build, close to the buildings just as we are. First, I think I'll step into the candy store and look over the new comics and let them pass. But that's chicken, and I got a reputation to consider. So, then I think I'll just walk straight on through them, or even over them if necessary. But, as they get to me, they slow down. I'm ready to fight, because like I said, I don't feature a whole lot of chit-chat. I much prefer to just knock you down right from the, from the jump, and save everybody a lot of precious time. You signing up for the May Day races? Smiles Mary Louise, only it's not a smile at all. A dumb question like that doesn't deserve an answer. Besides, there's just me and Gretchen standing there, really, so no use wasting my breath talking to shadows. I don't think you're going to win this time, says Rosie, trying to signify with her hands on her hips all salty, completely forgetting that I whooped her behind many times for less salt than that. I always win, because I'm the best, I say straight to at Gretchen, who is, as far as I'm concerned, the only one talking in this ventriloquist dummy routine. Gretchen smiles, but it's not a smile, and I'm thinking that girls never really smile at each other because they don't know how, and don't want to know how, and there's probably no one to teach us how, because grown-up girls don't, talk, don't know either. Then they all look at Raymond, who has just brought his mule team to a standstill, and they're about to see what trouble they can get into through him. What grade are you in now, Raymond? You got anything to say to my brother? You say it to me, Mary Louise Williams of Raggedy Town, Baltimore. What are you, his mother? Sasses Rosie. That's right, fatso, and the next word out of anybody, and I'll be their mother too. So they just stand there, and Gretchen shifts from one leg to the other, and so do they. Then Gretchen puts her hands on her hips and is about to say something with her freckle-faced self, but doesn't. Then she walks around me, looking me up and down, but keeps walking up Broadway, and her sidekick follows her. So me and Raymond smile at each other, and he says, Giddy up! in his team, and I continue with my breathing exercises, strolling down Broadway to the Iceman on 145th with not a care in the world because I am Miss Quicksilver herself. I take my time getting to the park on May Day because the track meet is the last thing on the program. The biggest thing on the program is the maypole dancing, which I can do without, thank you, even if my mother thinks it's a shame I don't take part and act like a girl for a change. You'd think my mother'd be grateful not to have to make me all white, organdy dress with a big satin sash and buy me new white baby doll shoes that can't be taken out of the box till the big day. You'd think she'd be glad her daughter ain't out there prancing around the maypole getting the new clothes all dirty and sweaty and trying to act like a fairy or a flower or whatever you're supposed to be when you should be trying to be yourself. Whatever that is, which is, as far as I'm concerned, a poor black girl who really can't afford to buy new shoes and a new dress you only wear once a lifetime because it won't fit next year. I was once a strawberry in a Hansel and Gretel pageant when I was in nursery school. I didn't have no better sense than to dance on tiptoe with my arms in a circle over my head doing umbrella steps and being a perfect fool just so my mother and father could come dressed up and clap. You'd think they'd know better than to encourage that kind of nonsense. I am not a strawberry. I do not dance on my toes. I run. That is what I am all about. So I always come late to the May Day program just in time to get my number pit on and lay in the grass so they announce the 50-yard dash. I put Raymond in the little swings, which is a tight squeeze this year, and will be impossible next year. Then I look around for Mr. Pearson, who pins the numbers on. I'm really looking for Gretchen, if you want to know the truth, but she's not around. The park is jam-packed. Parents in hats and corsages and breast pocket handkerchiefs peeking up. Kids in white dresses and light blue suits. The parkies unfolding chairs and chasing the rowdy kids from Lennox, as if they had no right to be there. The big guys with their caps on backwards, leaning against the fence, rolling the basketballs on the tips of the fingers, waiting for all these crazy people to clear out the park so they can play. Most of the kids in my class are carrying bass drums and glockenspiels and flutes. You'd think they put in a few bongos or something for real like that. 
Then here comes Mr. Pearson with his clipboard and his cards and pencils and whistles and safety pins and 50 million other things he's always dropping all over the place with his clumsy self. He sticks out in the crowd because he's on stilts. We used to call him Jack and the Beanstalk to get him mad, but I'm the only one that can outrun him and get away, and I'm too grown for that silliness now. Well, Squeaky, he says, checking my name off the list and handing me number seven and two pins, and I'm thinking he's got no right to call me Squeaky if I can't call him Beanstalk. Hazel Elizabeth Deborah Parker, I corrected him, and tell him to write it down on his board. Well, Hazel Elizabeth Deborah Parker, going to give someone else a break this year? I squint at him real hard to see if he's seriously thinking I should lose the race on purpose just to give someone else a break. Only six girls running this time, he continues, shaking his head sadly, like it's my fault of all, it's my fault all of New York didn't turn out in sneakers. That new girl should give you a run for your money. He looks around the park for Gretchen like a periscope in a submarine movie. Wouldn't it be nice, a nice gesture if you were to, uh... I give him such a look he couldn't finish putting the ideas into words. Grown-ups got a lot of nerves sometimes. I pin number seven to myself and stomp away. I'm so burnt. I go straight for the track and stretch out on the grass while the band winds up with Oh, the monkey wrapped his tail around the flagpole, which my teacher calls by some other name. The man of the loudspeaker is calling everyone over to the track, and I'm on my way back looking at the sky, trying to pretend I'm in the country. But I can't, because even grass in the city feels hard as sidewalk. And there's just no pretending you're anywhere but in a concrete jungle, as my grandfather says. The 20-yard dash takes all of two minutes, because most of the little kids don't know no better than to run off the track or run the wrong way or run smack into the fence and fall down and cry. One little kid, though, he has got the good sense to run straight for the white ribbon up ahead so he wins. Then the second graders line up for the 30-yard dash, and I don't even bother to turn my head to watch, because Rafael Perez always wins. He wins before he even begins by psyching the runners, telling them they're going to trip on their shoelaces and fall on their faces or lose their shorts or something, which he doesn't really have to do since he is very fast, almost as fast as I am. After that is the 40-yard dash, which I used to run when I was in first grade. Raymond is hollering from the swings because he knows I'm about to do my thing because the man of the loudspeaker has just announced the 50-yard dash. Although he might just as well be giving a recipe for angel food cake because you can hardly make out what he's saying for the static. I get up and slip off my sweatpants and I see Gretchen standing at the starting line kicking her legs out like a pro. Then, as I get into place, I see that old Raymond is on line on the other side of the fence, bending down with his fingers on the ground just like he knew what he was doing. I was going to yell at him, but then I didn't. It burns up your energy to holler. Every time, just before I take off in a race, I always feel like I'm in a dream. The kind of dream you have when you're sick with fever and feel all hot and weightless. I dream I'm flying over a sandy beach in the early morning sun, kissing the leaves of the trees as I fly by. And there's always a smell of apples, just like in the country when I was little. I used to think I was a choo-choo train running through the fields of corn and chugging up the hill to the orchard. And all the time I'm dreaming this, I get lighter and lighter until I'm flying over the beach again, getting blown through the sky like a feather that weighs nothing at all. But once I spread my fingers in the dirt and crouch over the get on your mark, the, dre the dream goes and I am solid again. And I'm telling myself, Squeaky, you must win. You must win. You're the fastest thing in the world. You can even beat your father of Amsterdam if you really try. And then I feel my weight coming back just behind my knees, then down to my feet, then into the earth, and the pistol, ex shot, the pistol shot explodes in my blood, and I'm off and weightless again, flying past the other runners, my arms pumping up and down, and the whole world is quiet, except for the crunch as I zoom over the gravel on the track. I glance to my left, and there is no one. To the right, a blurred Gretchen, who's got her chin jutting out as if it would win the race all by itself. And on the other side of the fence is Raymond with his arms down to his side and the palms tucked up behind him, running in his very own style. And it's the first time I ever saw that. And I almost stopped to watch my brother Raymond on his first run. But the white ribbon is bouncing toward me, and I tear past it, racing into the distance to my feet, till my feet, with a mind of their own, start digging up footfuls of dirt and break me short. Then all the kids standing on the side pile on me, banging me on the back, slapping my head with their May Day programs, for I have won again, and everybody on 151st Street can walk tall for another year. In first place, the man on the loudspeaker is clear as a bell now, but then he pauses and the loudspeaker starts to whine. Then, static. And I lead down to catch my breath, and here comes Gretchen walking back, for she's overshot the finish line too, huffing and puffing with her hands on her hips, taking it slow, breathing in steady time, like a real pro, 
and I sort of like her for a little while for the first time. In first place, and then three or four voices get all mixed up on the loudspeaker, and I dig my sneaker into the grass and stare at Gretchen, who's staring back. We both wondering who just who me. We both wondering just who did win. I can hear old Beanstalk arguing with the man on the loudspeaker, and then a few others running the mouths about what the stopwatches say. Then I hear Raymond yanking at the fence to call me, and I wave to shush him. But he keeps rattling the fence like a gorilla in a cage, like in the, them gorilla movies. But then, like a dancer or something, he starts climbing up nice and easy, but very fast. And it occurs to me, watching how smoothly he climbed over hands and remembering how he looked running with his arms down to his side and with the wind pulling his mouth back and his teeth showing it all, it occurred to me that Raymond would make a very fine runner. Doesn't he always keep up with me on my trots? And he surely knows how to breathe in counts of seven, because he's always doing it at the dinner table, which drives my brother George up the wall. And I'm smiling to beat the band, because I've lost track this... I've lost... And I'm smiling to beat the band, because I, if I've lost this race, or if me and Gretchen tied, or even if I've won, I can always retire as a runner and begin a whole new career as a coach with Raymond as my champion. After all, with a little more study, I can beat Cynthia and her phony self at the spelling bee. And if I bug my mother, I could get piano lessons and become a star. And I have a big rep as the baddest thing around. And I've got a room full of ribbons and medals and awards. But what has Raymond got to call his own? So I stand there with my new plans, laughing out loud by this time as Raymond jumps down from the fence and runs over with his teeth showing and his arms down to the side, which no one before him has quite mastered as a running style. And by the time he comes over, I'm jumping up and down, so glad to see him, my brother Raymond, a great runner in the family tradition. But of course, everybody thinks I'm jumping up and down because of the men on the loudspeaker have finally gotten themselves together and compared notes and are announcing. In first place, Miss Hazel Elizabeth Deborah Parker. Dig that. In second place, Miss Gretchen P. Lewis. And I look over at Gretchen wondering what the P stands for, and I smile. Because she's good, no doubt about it. Maybe she'd like to help me coach Raymond. She obviously is serious about running, as any fool can see. And she nods to congratulate me. And then she smiles. And I smile. We stand there with this big smile of respect between us. It's about as real as a smile as girls can do for each other, considering we don't practice real smiling every day, you know, because maybe we too busy being flowers or fairies or strawberries instead of something honest and worthy of respect, you know, like being people. The end. That's Raymond Run, you guys. Hope you liked it.